Hey Spain lovers, I know a lot of you are very curious about what it takes to buy a house in Spain, but you're a little bamboozled by all the bureaucracy, all the terms, and the thought of kind of going through all the paperwork and figuring it out is kind of overwhelming and you got a lot of questions, especially if you don't live here in Spain. We totally understand. And so today we're gonna to take you step by step the process of buying a house. We're gonna demystify all the terms, kind of everything, all the paperwork, all the bureaucracy, because we've just been through the process. We just bought our first home in Spain. If you don't know us, we are James and Yoli and we make videos to help you explore Spain like a local, whether you are visiting or actually planning to live here. And so last week we released a video about the search for your dream home. And today we're making a video about the actual process of buying. So if you want to have a look at that other video about the search process, we'll link to it below. Yeah, I recommend watching that one first, but uh, you know, whatever works for you. So venga, let's go. So in this video, we're going to cover the following key steps that you'll need to follow when you buy a house. Step number one, how long does it take? Number two, extra steps for non-residents. I know a lot of you have questions about that. Step three is the negotiation, the whole Spanish kind of culture around that. Step three is getting a mortgage, how that process works, a little different for residents and non-residents. Step five, we're gonna go through some of the key documents that you need to know about and the extra fees and things like that. Next, the pre-purchase contracts that you'll need to sign before you actually sign the deed of sale. Then we're gonna go through the valuation, also the role of the notary. And finally, that moment where you sit down and you you sign on the dotted line and they hand you the keys, the deed of sale. And to help you really get to grips with this kind of complicated process, we've also created a Spanish house buyers checklist PDF that you can download by clicking a link in the description. Just a reminder, the checklist is not a replacement for this video. We'll go into more detail here, but hopefully by having it all written down, that will kind of help you. You don't have to take notes while you're watching well, us watch here. Gotta watch the video. Gotta watch the video. <laughs> all right, let's kick off with step number one. So number one, how long does it take? Well, like an old teacher of mine used to say, as long as a piece of string. The search took us about a year or so to find that dream home. And then from the moment we saw it until we bought it, there was two months spent in all the paperwork, getting the mortgage, all of that. So a long lead up, but then a pretty quick process at the end. So number two, if you're a non-resident, if you don't live here, what are the extra steps in the process? Now, this is something we get asked a lot, and I know it can be pretty confusing. There are a few extra steps. They're not massively complicated though. Broadly speaking, the process of buying a house is the same. So one key step is you're gonna have to get what's called a numero de identidad extranjero. Ole. Which, <laughs> I did that well, which is a NIE, is kind of the colloquial, the short term. And it's not like an identity card. Sometimes it's confused with that. It's just a number that you need to get to be able to do, I think, like financial transactions in Spain. So your lawyer who you contract in Spain, you know, Pro Spain offer that service or others, they can help you get that, that number. And that's something that you need by law. The other part of this is a bank account. Now, I don't believe there's a legal requirement for you to have a bank account in Spain to buy a house in Spain. It just makes things easier, right? It, yeah, much easier. Alexander from Pro Spain was telling me that in, in effect, it's just harder to be making all these transfers if you're paying the fees, the notary oh. fees from overseas. It's just much easier to have a bank account here. So, so that's really, really recommended. The third piece, this is not a requirement, but you can get a Spanish mortgage. We touched on the details of that in the last video. Effectively, it's the same, but you'll probably have to put down a larger deposit because mm. you're a non-resident, up to about 50% deposit right. compared to residents. Yeah. And if you do get a mortgage here in Spain, what happened to us is they actually, well, give you a bank account at the same time. So those things can be bundled together. The last thing that I would say is a lawyer. Now we didn't use a lawyer in the process of buying a house. I had the wonderful Yoli here who understands Spanish <laughs> and all this I understand Spanish very well. great Spanish speaker I must say. and all this very complex kind of terminology. We were able to figure it out. But I would say if you're not comfortable with that, and also if you are overseas, particularly, I would recommend a lawyer. Or if you also want them to take certain steps that we actually didn't take and there was some risk involved in that, we'll go over that as we go through. Yeah. If you don't live in Spain and you don't plan to be here, that's okay. You can give your lawyer power of attorney mm. and they can do all the steps for you. Mm. Generally, a lawyer charges 1% of the purchase price. That's kind of the going rate. I know that's what Pro Spain charges, for example. So that gives you an idea of some of the elements that are required if you don't live here. Number three, negotiation. 
So negotiation is kind of expected in Spain. It's part of the real estate culture, let's say. It's part uh, of the general culture. <laughs> <laughs> as well, yeah. The, we like a little bit of bargaining here yeah. and there. So yes, they will list a price and then you will push down. You will start the negotiation process. We did lose a house a few months ago mm. because we were a little bit too aggressive in the process and they just kind of said, ciao. So negotiation for us. So our place was listed in Idealista for 270,000. So we started the negotiation process by offering 250,000 they said no way 260 they said we were like mm, no to your world maybe 255 and they were like no no can you just go up a little bit more 257 in the end so that was the final price the agreed price it was a really fast process it took kind of like 24 hours really because there was a real estate agent kind of pushing the, the process forward a little bit. So how do you know how much to offer really? There is a series of tools online that you can check. They are valuation tools. Bankia has one, BBVA has another one. Idealista, I believe, has another one. No, they're all one. free. And yes, they're all free. And you just put in the address, the exact address, and they're gonna tell you more or less how much money you should be paying for it. I just did the valuation on this property now. The current um, value. And we know what we paid. So it's to give you down. an idea, <laughs> it's gone down because of COVID. <laughs> it was listed for 270, we paid 257. Bankia is now listing it as 271. Bebe Uwea is listing it at 266. And Idealista is listing it at 250 to give you an idea. So number four, the mortgage. How did we find our mortgage here in Spain? So you could just go online to the different banks and see what mortgage products they're offering. But really, once you start talking to the banks, what we found, they're gonna start offering you things and talking to you about things that aren't listed on the yeah, website. Everything is a medida or custom, yes. we would say. So we actually had a friend who recommended a, a service or a couple of services that you could get that are free. <laughs> one is provided by Idealista and one is provided by Iauro. And what they will do is you give them your information contact, a lot of information a lot of information <laughs> yeah and i think this is where the payment comes in yeah. and they will supposedly find the best offers for you and then feed you back say three offers that, that match your needs hmm. so we actually did both i wouldn't recommend that because it's all the banks get overlapped and yeah. it's always very very they confusing get confused and, yeah. hmm. it's a nightmare no. so pick one idealista was not a good experience effectively what they do i think is they just sell your information to the banks maybe they're getting a commission not quite sure but iauro was actually quite good the guy who took who took care of our case yeah. he did select i mean we still have to sign over all the information yeah. but he did select three banks and came back with them and we chose one of them which was bank inter so why did we choose the bank inter mortgage what were we looking for well obviously the interest rate was key but really what was key was looking at the different features that they offered so we didn't want a mortgage that had a whole bunch of products attached so when we went to some of the more traditional banks they're like you've got to get this credit card as well you've got to get life insurance we didn't want any of that stuff any of those things that we wouldn't be paying for normally yeah. it did come with home insurance seguro de hogar but that by law you have to have the other thing is we wanted to be able to pay it off early so if we had extra money in a certain month we wanted to play, pay that down oh so, those were the years yeah exactly pre-covid <laughs> so that was called that's called amortización gratuita mm. so that's free payoff so the third thing that we wanted we didn't want any opening fees so comisión de apertura we didn't want to pay any of that so in all these cases Bank Inter and other banks as well fit our needs now when you go and choose a mortgage there's kind of three options for interest rates that you can choose here in Spain there's fijo variable and mixto fijo means a fixed interest rate so it's not going to move over the life of the mortgage variable means move according to interest rates according to the market and mixto is a little bit of a mix of both I don't really understand it but Yoli's told me that it's not recommended so <laughs> that's all I know about that and that's all I know about exactly. that. that's all we know so you have to do your own research on that one but fijo uh, we chose that we're, we're not high risk people and so we didn't want suddenly the, the interest rates to shoot up and interest rates are pretty low at the moment anyway so we wanted to lock in that low interest rate and how long did we sign for was it 30 20 20 years we signed a 20 year 20 mortgage good. yeah 20 yeah. is good mm -hmm. and so that's kind of the mortgage deal just remember we put down a 20 percent of the purchase price deposit if you're a non-resident you're going to have to put down more maybe 30 maybe 40 maybe up to 50 in these covid times mm. as a deposit so next one there's a few fees and taxes that you need to add on top of the purchase price mm. in the previous video we uh, talked about 10 12 percent it varies uh, on top of the purchase price that you're going to be paying in fees and taxes now the main one is a tax that is either itp or iva 
ITP is the Impuesto de Transmisiones Patrimoniales. A real mouthful. It's like a <laughs> property transfer tax. Yeah, and you pay that on second-hand places. In Madrid, it's 6% of the purchase price. The ITP varies from region to region. Uh, we'll be including the information in the checklist below. Now, if you're buying a new home, you will be paying IVA, which is VAT. It's a tax and it's 10% in the whole of Spain, apart from the Canary Islands. 7% I think they're 7 right. 7%? 7% yeah. in the Canary Islands. And then there's a bunch of fees that you're going to be paying as well. Uh, these are lesser, but yeah, they're also to be taken into account when you are planning your, your budget, of course, for the house. Now, we paid for the notario, the notary, you know, the person that is going to be writing the, the deed of purchase. We'll talk about them in a moment, <laughs> that famous person. So we paid around 700 euros. Then you'll pay your tax, of course. So in our case, secondhand, we paid ITP. And that was 15,000 euros. That's the biggest, that's the biggie, Cha really. <laughs> then the registro, now you're paying for having your property, registered in the National Registry of Property. Uh, for that, we paid 230 euros. And then the gestión. The gestión is a service that the bank offers you and you can't really say no. They just drive the process for you. You don't really have to do anything. You don't really need to even uh, pay the invoice to the notario. They will do all of that. For that, they will get some more money from you, from the bank account. You need to have it ready. So now that service, the gestión, for us, it was 420 euros. And then, of course, it's not listed here because we did it a little bit earlier, but the tasación, depending on the bank, they're going to make you pay for it or they're going to pay for it themselves. So the total for all these extras, including the tax, was 16,719.99 cents. So, mm -hmm. you know, you've got your 20% or if you're overseas, 50%, you've got to think about these extra things on top of it yeah. as well, that extra 10-ish percent. That is not covered by the mortgage. Exactly. Remember. Oh yeah, that's really important. The mm -hmm. bank's not paying for that, you're paying for that in cash. So number six, throughout this process, you're really have to make sure all the documentation is in order and this is important and again I had Yoli who, who kind of could understand all the stuff really well this is where a lawyer really can step in and, and provide a lot of value so one document that's key is called the nota simple and the nota simple is really a document that tells you about the property that you're buying so it covers are there any debts on the property the owner's information what are the boundaries of the land yeah. it also covers how the property is classified is it residential is it a commercial yeah yeah you need to you know pay attention because things happen sometimes. <laughs> you never know. So the other thing is the ITE, Inspección Técnica de Edificios. And effectively, this is just a technical review that uh, buildings have now and again, which shows that, you know, they're in working order, that they're structurally sound, that yeah. they have insulation. So you want yeah. to check that to make sure everything is in order. So there's also some other things that Alexander from Pro Spain told me that they check when they're helping a client buy a property. We didn't check all these things particularly. We didn't really know to check some of them, but just to give you a heads up about them. So one thing they'll do is they will check the, any debts on the property. Now when you go into the process of buying a house, the notary will check if there's any debts for the last year on the property, but they will go and check, the lawyers will check for the last three years. Mm. And so that's important because you're liable for debts on the property up until three years previous to your purchase. So they'll take care of that. They'll also check the kind of the urban plan and see if there's any infrastructure things being planned in the area. Is a hospital being planned that would rise property values? Is an airport being planned that will that will plummet property values. Yeah. So the other thing they will check is the comunidad. They will check if that's all working. Is there any debts there? Another thing that's important to check if you have a terraza, which we do, the terraza generally will not be listed on the escritura, which is kind of like the property deed, because it's usually owned in common. Mm -hmm. It's a very weird thing, can't quite get my head around it, but the person whose house is kind of stuck to the terrace, who's using that terrace, has the right to uso y disfrute. Mm -hmm. So it means like you have the right to use that property, even though legally it's not in your property deed. Yeah. So it's important to make sure that you have that right, it's listed somewhere. And as I mentioned before, the other thing is that if you're not in the country, you can get your lawyer to do all these things for you in person by giving them a power of attorney, mm -hmm. so that exists. Now, Number seven, the contrato de reserva. Now, if you're doing this particular a particular, the private owner, you're not really going to be doing a contrato de reserva. This is really something that you do if you are dealing with a real estate agent. So basically it's a document that says that you have agreed on the price, 
it says what the price is and it's a commitment to take the property off the website or off you know idealista or any of the listings that uh, it might be on and you had to keep chasing them up so effectively yeah they won't keep showing the property but after we put down a thousand euros in our case you saw it was still on idealista because someone it was like listed forever someone went on a holiday i was like every single day almost saying so i see it's still on are you going to take it off oh no such and such is on a holiday so they just took forever this is one of the things that really annoyed me with the with our real estate agent mm. uh, but anyway so that's the contrato de reserva for you so next, the Contrato de Arras, the famous Contrato de Arras. And if you Google this, you'll get a definition like earnest money contract, which is ridiculous. A good translation is deposit agreement. So unlike the Contrato de Reserva, which is like, you know, stop listing it. This is really your commitment to say, I'm going to buy this property. So this is an amount of money that you pay to the seller that confirms that you are going to buy this property and they confirm to you that they are going to sell it to you. It effectively means that nobody can step in and go, zump you, suddenly somebody offers more money. So it's actually really helpful in a lot of ways, but there are some traps to this contract and some misunderstandings. So here you go, because what happens is that if you've paid your, your money with the Arras contract, if you back out as the buyer, you will forfeit that money. Now, if the seller backs out, they will have to pay you that money times two. So if you put down 10,000 as the Arras agreement amount, and you backed out, you pay 10 grand, you lost 10 grand. If the seller backs out, they have to pay you 20 grand. Sounds very medieval. But what it does is it gives you the time to get the mortgage together. It's really, really important. Yeah. And often when you're looking for a mortgage, you can start the process early, I recommend that. But banks really don't want to talk to you until you have an Arras agreement, because then they know, okay, this is a real client. Yeah, it's for real. Exactly. Yeah. So there's two things you need to know about the Arras, the amount that you pay and also the length of time that this contract should be set up for. When it comes to the amount, there's a lot of information out there that says the Arras is generally 10% of the purchase price. So in our case, that would have been 25, almost 26 grand that we would have paid potentially to lose if we didn't get the mortgage. Yeah. There is nothing written in law about what percentage or what amount the Arras needs to be. Yeah. For some context, we paid six grand. You just speak to the seller and you create an agreement. Yeah. That's six grand and that's just over 2%. Yeah. Also a banker friend of mine advised that, hey, you know, 6,000 to maybe 10,000 maximum, yeah. but no, no nothing. Don't nothing go like higher. Trying, no. So that's the amount. The other thing is the amount of time. So the Arras contract has in it stipulated that from the moment of signing, this agreement is in effect for a certain amount of time, whether it's one month, two months, or three months, or whatever you agree. And if you can't get your money together to buy that house in that amount of time, you're gonna lose that money that you that you paid to the seller as part of the Arras contract. So this banker friend of Yoli's was really helpful because she said, get three months, make yeah. it three months. And that was really, really helpful in the end because we needed all that time to get the yeah. mortgage together, yeah. talking to so many banks. It also meant we weren't under pressure to get a mortgage in a, in a short space of time and not get a good mortgage. So we could really do our research. Yeah. So the Arras contract, get 90 days, really important. So number eight, the tasación or the official valuation. Now the bank is going to give you a mortgage based on the whatever value that has been appointed by the valuer, right? So they are, before giving you the mortgage, they are going to send an official valuation to the property to just evaluate how much money it is worth, right? So in the end, what's really, really important is that the tasación, the value of the given by the valuer, is the same or more than the purchase, the agreed purchase price, because the bank will then use that number to give you the mortgage. So uh, for example, say that the agreed purchase price is 250. The valuer goes and says, I reckon it's 240. Then uh, the bank will give you 80% uh, or 60% of that 240, not 250 that you're paying for. So you will have to cover those 10,000 euros on top by yourself without the mortgage help. Now the valuer, uh, it needs to be an official one. Usually the bank will provide or suggest their own, but you can also just um, bring someone it needs to be official that's the that's the only thing in our case we paid 257 the valuer went to the place well came here we were here actually she was measuring everything and just kind of taking Very photos intense. and everything and she said that the value of the house was 260 very very close to 257 so the idea is that uh, they're independent but in the end the bank is going to say to the valuer just make sure that the value is not lower than 257. 
So number nine, the mysterious magical notary. Now this is a role, el notario, here in Spain that I don't think exists in, in say New Zealand, for instance, but it's a role that is necessary when you're buying a house and you're gonna have to pay for them. They will be recommended by the bank or the bank might have their own one, but you can go and find your own one, get a recommendation. I'll mention the guy that we use in the checklist as well. So the notary effectively is in charge of writing up the deed, writing up the agreements, and also of witnessing them. So they're at various crucial stages in the process. So before you go and sign the deed of sale, they will sit you down in a meeting or your lawyer if you have a power of attorney, and they will read out to you the agreement so that you know what you're effectively signing. And then they will be there when you do the official signing meeting. Even the mortgage, they will uh, read to you the documents of the mortgage. So it's really making sure that you know what you're signing, how exactly. much money you're going to be paying every month, what the conditions are. And finally, number 10, sign the deed of sale. Ooh. Moment of truth. So this is the day that you go to the office of the notary and you go there to sign the deed of sale, the escritura. We have our own one here. Escritura, very beautiful, very beautiful document. So who's going to go to that meeting? Uh, well, it's gonna be obviously the buyer. Everyone goes. <laughs> Everyone goes, it's a big party. The buyer, the seller, the bank representative who is going to actually give the check with which you pay the full amount of the price, of course. Mm. There's going to be the real estate agent, if there is one. There's going to be the notary, of course, and am I forgetting someone? To be a the lawyer. lawyer, if uh, you're using a lawyer to represent you with their power of attorney, possibly. And so this is the moment when you finally get your keys. Your keys, ma'am. <laughs> so this is where you sign it, you get your keys and the house is yours. And there's a few bits and pieces after that. You've got to go and get a drink and celebrate with a lovely lunch. Or so a coffee in our case. Did we get a cup of coffee, did we? I don't know, it must have been a busy day. So. Yeah, it was. And so after this is when that ITP tax was paid, the bank took care of that for us, but obviously that doesn't happen until yeah. you've actually transferred the property. Also the registry. Mm, it has to get added to the registry. Time, yeah. And the bank did that for us as well. And then it's yours to move into. So guys, go ahead and download that checklist that I've prepared with Pro Spain Consulting, that, that Spanish home buyer's guide that will really help. And if you're interested in more videos about owning a home in Spain, we're gonna be making more about the experience of the ongoing costs, what it's like to renovate, all that kind of stuff. So subscribe if you wanna follow us and, and learn more about the experience of, yeah, having your own place in Spain. Until the next video, Ciao. we'll see you soon. Ciao.